Thank you, Dara. So hello, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, so my name is Jenna Karala, and I work for the city of Turku as a tech officer. Uh, we have Mervi Lehto and Juha Jokela uh, here as well. Uh, they have both been part of the project, and they will be and they will be answering the questions later uh, during the Q and A session. But um, next, I'm going to tell you about how our port area has been developed so far and how Hub Mobile project has been a part of it. Mm, well, uh, vision for the city center of Turku is probably where we should begin. Uh, this is uh, or this vision is based on city strategy uh, 2029, which is actually um, the year when Turku turns 800 years. Mm, based on uh, this uh, city's strategy, uh, a multidisciplinary vision team contemplated uh, the future of the city center. And uh, the objective of uh, vision work was to improve the attractiveness and public spaces in the city, uh, to unify the functionalities of the city center and to ensure that the city center space has the conditions for lively cultural life and event activities. Um, aim was also to increase the number of inhabitants and vacancies at the center and to restore the faith in the center as a feasible object of investment. Uh, an important goal was also to ensure the accessibility of the center and uh, smooth mobility with all modes of transport. And this vision was published in 2017 and it has set the direction for development. Uh, the Spearhead project of developing the city center is basically a project that is bringing uh, this vision for the city center into action. Um, development of the city center is steered by these uh, three focal points, uh, which are an accessible city center with smooth mobility, uh, a commercially attractive city center, and a pleasant and vivid city center of encounters. Um, in accordance with uh, international trends and success stories of other cities, uh, new, st uh, new street sections uh, will gradually become more walking and cycling oriented. Uh, increasing sustainable mobility will advance the climate objectives of the city, uh, also uh, making the city center more comfortable. Um, here are some of the goals set for transport and mobility. Uh, a new public transport street with several transit hubs. Expanding the pedestrian network to the most attractive spots of the city. An extensive cycling network with own one-way uh, one lanes for cycling. And linking together different modes of transport with world-class services. And in the action plan of the vision for the city center was also listed an aim to limit drive through traffic um, on the streets of the innermost center. And actually within Hub Mobile project, uh, we conducted a through traffic study in the center of Turku. Uh, but Ralph will tell you more about this later today. Uh, the key of the vision is expanding the heart of the city center and creating a user-oriented transport system, supporting it and enabling growth. And based on the vision, the commercial city center will expand from the surroundings of the market square towards the riverbank and the port in the one direction and towards the university campus and Kubita the other direction. As the city center expands, one goal is to provide seamless uh, connections between these concentrations of mobility and traffic. Uh, the aim is also to develop the surroundings of the harbor into a more center-like area, and this way integrate um, the center to the archipelago without jeopardizing the operation possibilities of the harbor. Mm, to, give, <clears throat> to give this uh, area some context, uh, the port of Turku is located in, in Naniemi, which is an area at the junction of the Arda River and the Archipelago Sea. At the heart of the Cape sits um, Turku Castle, 
which is the oldest and most valuable part of the area and one of Finland's best known and most popular sites and tourist destinations. Uh, the port is already directly accessible, for example, by train and long distance buses, which is yet a clear advantage when it comes to sustainable mobility uh, options for passengers. Uh, however, the areas surrounding the current port terminals have been built in stages and are perceived as difficult to grasp. Uh, the street network is mainly dimensioned for the needs of heavy traffic and the solutions are outdated and fragmented the traffic areas dominate this valuable uh, cultural landscape. Um, also the railway in its current location, so here, as you can see, um, uh, in its current location is causing a barrier between the castle and the shore. Castle is here. <laughs> and uh, in order to free up space for the city development in the area, the goal has been to move the railway track to another location. Um, in order to develop the historically and culturally important area, in 2018, the two shipping companies operating in Turku Harbor, as well as the port of Turku and the city of Turku, signed a strategic letter of intent of a common goal to develop the port area. Um, the planning was divided into ferry terminal Turku project plan led by the port of Turku and traffic and mobility master plan carried out, out by um, the city of Turku and prepared within the hub mobile project. Um, in, in order to ensure smooth uh, development process between different actors, uh, a joint cooperation model was prepared within hub mobile project as well. Um, this model uh, focuses on recognizing different uh, processes, projects and stakeholders or uh, stakeholder groups in the area. Uh, you can find the model from the Hub Mobile Projects website and take a closer look at it later. Um, the ferry terminal project started in August 2019. Uh, the project aims for improvement of the operating conditions of passenger traffic, as well as the development of traffic arrangements in the uh, port of Turku. Uh, the goal is to build a new joint terminal building for the two shipping companies by uh, 2025. And actually an architectural competition of the terminal building is uh, currently running. Um, the preparation of the traffic and mobility master plan for Turku port area started in autumn 2019. Uh, the starting point of the work was to create a plan for the development of the traffic arrangements and mobility services in the area, taking um, all modes of transport into account. Uh, the purpose of the plan was to connect the planned uh, joint terminal smoothly and safely uh, with its surroundings to improve the accessi accessibility uh, of the port area and to promote forms of sustainable mobility. And to support uh, the master planning of the Turku port area, a survey concerning the mobility habits of the residents of Turku region was conducted by Aalto University as part of the Hub Mobile project. And you will also hear more about this later today. Uh, also as a part of Hub Mobile project, Turku was um, a case city in the simulation based participatory modeling of KTH. Uh, because of the development of this harbor area uh, and they will also tell more about it in their presentation. Uh, in January 2020, the city of Turku organized an international idea competition for, Linnan, for the Linnaniemi area uh, in order to find a comprehensive uh, overall idea as well as innovative development options for the historically and culturally important area. And uh, the railway connection in the traffic and mobility master plan that was at the time under preparation was relocated to go from north. Um, this connection was used as a baseline data in the Lima DME IDEA competition. In October 2020, the results of the competition were announced. Uh, a Lithuanian Finnish team awarded the first prize in their competition or in the, in the competition with their uh, proposal called Metpala. 
the competition program stated that the competition organizer would negotiate a possible further commission uh, with the others of the winning proposal. And also the jury recommended to use the winning entry as a basis for further planning. Uh, at the turn of the month, October, November 2020, uh, the city of Turku organized a pop-up exhibition where the prize-winning entries of the competition, uh, results of all the university's survey about residents' mobility habits, uh, and the tentative traffic and mobility master plan for Turku port area were on display, and the visitors were, were able to comment uh, them either on the spot or online through online public, uh, public hearing website. Also, side events like guided walking tours, uh, a neighborhood hunt, and webinars were arranged for residents to get more acquainted with the unique area and to get different resident groups involved in the development process. Uh, later, after the competition, the planned new railway connection from the north was relinquished. Uh, the main reason for this uh, was too high expenses. Uh, you can read more about the relocation planning process from the Hub Mobile website. Um, in May 2021, a discussion about the further commission began with the winning theme. Um, since the new railway connection coming from north was relinquished and the aim is to find a solution uh, that would allow the development of the area and enhance connections within Linnaniemi, a search for another uh, alternative location for the railway platform began. Uh, during fall 2021, uh, teams traffic consultants from uh, Sitowais have been investigating and making impact assessments of different options to dismantle the existing track uh, from the south to a new location. And this report should be ready by January 22. A uh, goal for the future is that the railway connection uh, to the port will be part of the Trans-European Transport uh, Core Network. And therefore, Sitowais is also studying what are the conditions of each alternative to connect the railway to the TNT uh, Core Network. Uh, the rest of the winning team is uh, working with more detailed land use plan for the area to support the city's master planning process. Uh, this work is scheduled to be ready by the end of February 22. Uh, the development process will be um, implemented in stages and eventually this historically and culturally important area will be a hub of year-round urban culture where you can simultaneously experience history, the sea and the archipelago. That's all from Turku's side. It has been a pleasure to be part of this project. Thank you so much for everyone involved. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Jenna. I think that was that was an excellent example of the of the holistic approach uh, we have been discussing on. So how you have actually used the different methods and others we have developed uh, during our project and this is I think something that's also from your reports others can learn but uh, now thank you very much uh, Jenna and I know you'll be answering the questions uh, after our lunch break as uh, also other participants from Turku as you said but as Jenna mentioned already in her presentations uh, also simulations were used and utilized in the development and next we have a uh, Professor Jankuk Jung, or Jake, uh, giving us a presentation of simulations in supporting mobility uh, decision. So, the floor is yours, Jake. Yep, thank you, Tero. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Tero mentioned, I'm Jankuk Jung, or Jake, from KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden. And I'm I would like to share our work from Hook Mobile project about simulation work. Uh, the title is the simulation in supporting mobility decision making. So we have developed some simulation models, and not only for the simulation model, we started from the data gathering and the discussion with the stakeholders, 
and the simulation model and simulation wizard analysis. So we will share the whole process that we have done in this project. And I also share some project cases during this project period. And before that, we go into the, the details about that. I would like to divide our title in the three parts. As I mentioned, we have simulation in supporting and mobility and decision making. So that means uh, we have different, we have used simulation as a supporting tool in our, uh, uh, as a, to support some activities in our, uh, in this project. So simulation is not just a service or some specific one, but we have used this simulation as a tool to support some activities. And the second one, the second part of this title is a mobility that is the target of our simulation. So we are focusing on the mobility uh, activities in the urban area in this project. And that means we have different stakeholders. For example, the city urban planners and maybe the, pedestri the pedestrians, some and the traffic and the, the citizens, policy makers and the engineers, and maybe some researchers can be involved. So in mobility situation in urban area, there are so many different type of stakeholders. So we need, when we get the data from the uh, different stakeholders, we need to follow the right framework and the right processes. And the last part of this presentation, we have decision-making. We, that means we, as I mentioned, like we will use the simulation as a supporting tool to help their decision-making process. That means we can use our simulation tool as a, 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 a to provide some uh, quantitative data and some, we can uh, execute out, we can have some experiment with the different type of scenarios uh, based on for, to help the decision making. So that is the main theme of our presentation and the main role of our work in this Hoop mobile project. So let's go into the, the case and the, some backgrounds. So as we all know about the urban mobility planning, as you can see in this short video, there are different type of stakeholders. And we have like a vehicles and the cyclists and the pedestrians. And we have not only for this kind of elements, there are some control system and the regulations and roles, and maybe the different city have different different cultures as well. But not only for that, uh, we might have some situation as took uh, faced, we need to renovate or some, we need to reorganize our city. So when we have a, a reorganized the cities, we could have some brownfield project or we could have a totally new project as a greenfield project. But we don't know and we cannot estimate just for the layout, just for the drawings. We need to uh, get the, the maybe the cost estimation or we could also analyze, we should also analyze a traffic analysis using the simulation tool. And simulation as a tool is very efficient way to do because we can model the simulation uh, based on the real situation and we could have different type of scenarios and we can provide the quantitative data to support the decision makers uh, decisions based on the, the quantitative data. That is the main role of the simulation in urban mobility planning. And nowadays, uh, there are many different stakeholders in urban area, as I mentioned before, but if we go into the traffic in our area, we do have the motorized traffic, which is the main uh, elements in the traffic in urban area. It could be the like, uh, vehicles, the, the passenger vehicles or some taxis or some other motorized, all the type of vehicles. And we have public transportations. Uh, some cities, they have, most of the city, they have a subway and the buses and the taxis. And some city in, the, like in the, this area, we have ferries for the public transportation. And as Truk, uh, Truk City mentioned, there are some terminals for the ferries and we, we need to also consider this traffic element in our simulation models. 
And we, to control this motorized traffic and the public transportation, we have a traffic light system. And many of the cities, they have a centralized traffic light system, traffic light control system to control the whole the traffic, area, traffic in the urban area. And the pedestrian, we have the pedestrian in the traffic area. And the cyclist, many of the cities in this area, we also have the cyclist as a main element in the traffic in our area. And in this hook mobile project, as I mentioned, we use simulation tool as a urban mobility planning decision support. And this is our basic uh, process in this project. So as you can see here, we, we consider these urban areas as our target, but not only for the urban areas, but we also consider this peri-urban area around these urban areas to uh, when, we mod when we build a simulation model. And in these urban areas, different type of element or different type of areas can be defined. For example, we could have residential areas and the industrial areas and the city center and airport and the port. And between these elements, we have transportations and the flights and goods and the passengers. And we could imagine all the different type of traffic flows and production logistics flows and supply chain flows, different type of flows can be defined. And we analyze this the inbound and outbound trans transport flows in their interactions. And based on this data, we developed a simulation-based multi-level optimization model. That means our simulation model is not a single uh, layer, but our simulation model can be uh, defined in the detail level or the high level of, uh, level of details based on the problem definition. For example, if we are focusing on the specific intersection, we can have a detailed simulation model only focusing on this uh, specific area, but we are we have a problem in the more higher level. For example, the maybe the location of the new uh, new terminal or location to analyze the whole the traffic flow in the city level. We don't need to go deep into. Go, we don't need to have a, that much detail for the like intersection level or the, the specific uh, pedestrian level. So we developed a multi-level optimization model based on the, the level of details in their problem. And we use Sumo as a simulation tool, simulation software in our project. Uh, the Sumo is the open source traffic simulation tool, and it is easy to import uh, the neutral type of data or for example, the open street map, we can easy to imply, uh, import the open street map in the Sumo. And there are different predefined libraries that we can use. So for example, we can easy to calculate their fuel consumption on the noise level and emissions as a sustainable perspective as well. So we, in this project, we calculate the waiting time or some um, typical KPIs for the traffic uh, traffic simulation, but also we also calculate the energy consumption and noise level and emission from the sustainability perspective. But as I mentioned in the whole process, it all depends on the level of the details of the problems. To, so to solve that problem, uh, we suggested the decision-making framework and the modeling framework for our simulation model. And this uh, research work is also published recently. So if you have any interest, you can check this paper, the, our the latest paper. So we follow this framework when we build a simulation model and when we define the simulation case. So as you can see here in the layer one, we have a very detailed level of the case. So it can be the manufacturers or the traders in the detail level. And we could also have the layer two as a higher level. So this layer two has a integration level based on this like a, a basic elements. And the layer three, the city level can be the layer three. So the, for example, the city administration can be involved in this layer three as a, a rule or the regulation in the city level. 
and the layer is the society level. So some tourists or the citizens who will use this simulation model or this application and for their uh, maybe they're finding the ways or the shortest path and and so on. So we follow this uh, decision making framework and all the informations and the advice and the direct and the negotiation can be used for based on this simulation framework. So we follow this simulation framework when we build a simulation model and we have uh, two cases from this hook mobile project. So the first case is from the truck city, uh, which was uh, presented before. So in the truck city case, uh, as we know, we have a city center here and the port area is defined here. And the truck city case, there is a ferry, uh, the, the ferry follow the schedule and the, every, every uh, specific time, the ferry can, will uh, park here. And we know there is a loading and unloading areas and near the port area. And from this loading and unloading time, the trucks and the passenger cars will travel from the port, port area to the city center. So we, we wanted to simulate which area can be, can have the higher traffic uh, based on this situation. And we also have some different type of scenarios for the, the uh, waiting area for the trucks. So we simulate based on this scenario and we import the truck city map from the open street map, which is the open source map. So we can uh, easy to Im import the simulation, uh, the, the background of the simulation model from the open street map. And we need to define the truck and the passenger car traffic from the ferry. And we, we had some assumption to simplify this case. So from the port, port, truck, uh, port of truck cargo statistics, we, we assume the number of the truck cargo traffic from the import to export. And uh, the remaining ferry, the capacity is assumed as a, to be filled with the passenger cars. So we have some assumptions for that. And we got some information about the route for the, uh, the truck and the passenger cars, the, the truck follows this area, the, this red area and the passenger car go to the city center. So we have some basic information from the truck city and the truck port. And also to uh, build a simulation model, we got some traffic flow data as a uh, Excel file and some, some statistics information. But we need to do some manual work to uh, convert this data to our simulation model because we cannot just import this uh, Excel file to our simulation model. So we convert this uh, traffic flow model uh, based on uh, from this Excel file and we define some origin and destination traffic flow using the SUMO's the basic uh, data type. Then we could develop this kind of simulation model using SUMO. So this is a simplified model. So every uh, the scheduled time, the ferry will arrive here. And when ferry arrived, the traffic, uh, the passenger cars and the trucks will be uh, uh, unloaded from this ferry. And the passenger go to the city center and the trucks will be go, uh, will, will follow the, the predefined route for the trucks. And we also have some trucks will be loaded to the ferries, the trucks are waiting here. And we have different scenarios for the, this waiting area for the trucks. And based on this different type of scenarios and the data, we calculate not only for the waiting time, but also we calculate the, uh, the emission, total amount of emission. And we suggested the different type of uh, engine for the trucks. So we could see the difference between the Euro uh, five engine type and Euro six engine type. There are some different uh, uh, differences, uh, different amount of total emission based on the engine type. But this is just one of the example, but we could also calculate different type of KPIs based on this, uh, based on this simulation model and scenario. So in this case, we have different type of scenario for the truck waiting area, and we have predefined KPIs for the 
the sustainability perspective. And let's go to the case, the second case, which is the Hamburg case. And the Hamburg case is more like has a uh, more higher, uh, it has more detail level. And in this case, we are, we are focusing on the traffic light simulation. Uh, we use the same simulation tool, the Sumo, and but the Sumo has a, a traffic control. Uh, we can simulate the traffic light uh, based on the Sumo as well. So this it has very detailed information as you can see here. So we, if I compare with the previous previous case from the truck case, uh, the truck case is more like a higher level, the city level simulation. But this Hamburg case, we are focusing on the specific intersection and we we analyze the traffic light signal. As you can see here, the, the how long the green lights will really remain and the yellow and the red and so on. And each lane, can, we can define the each uh, the route for the each lane. So the all the vehicle from this lane will follow this one, and we could change the all the variables for the this specific interaction. So it has more detail level, and the the problem definition is di different from the uh, the truck case, which has the series scale level. So to build a simulation model, uh, we import the public transportation, the schedule as an in, as a input data. So we have the bus, bus schedule and we build a simulation model uh, based on the, the open street map, same as the before, but we are focusing on this case and we uh, generate the traffic flow based on this uh, traffic schedule and some random generated traffic as a, uh, the passenger vehicles. So this is the simplified version of our simulation model for the Hamburg case. So we have bus stops and the detectors and the traffic signal. And in this case, we uh, added the cyclist as a, one of the element, uh, one of the key element of this Hamburg case. So we want to analyze how the traffic light system can be effect for the cyclists, not only for the traffic vehicles like a bus or the cars. So in this case, we could see the different uh, results based on the different type of traffic signals. So we calculate the waiting time for the cyclist and we calculate the waiting time for the vehicles and the bus schedule for the public transportation as well. So both cases are has a different both cases, the two we have two cases in Hoop Mobile project, and they are uh, they have a different interest. But all the 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 common thing in this simulation model building process, we follow this process. The as we as we can see here in the slide. So all the two cases, we have a different type of stakeholders because uh, not not only for the because our uh, I'm familiar with the production logistics simulation, which is the uh, simulation model for the factory level. And in that case, we don't need to consider that much stakeholders because we are analyzing the uh, the material flow in the the factory, and we just follow the some some uh, companies regulation. But in this case, we have different stakeholders. For example, the as I mentioned, like a city planners and the citizens and the and a different type of regulation for the different uh, elements, all the stakeholders are involved. So we, we are trying to follow the participatory design methodology, which is the, we can involve all the stakeholders in this problem uh, we uh, in, uh, we encourage them to involve not only for the the final result, not only for the problem problem definition. We uh, uh, have some recursive uh, meetings for with them and to check the to get the input data and to check the right process and to check the simulation model building and to check the final result as well. So from the beginning, the objective collection, all the stakeholders were involved and the uh, data collection as well. So we have different type of data, for example, the vehicle data or the 
the ferry, the schedule, and then we need to ask the, the ferry operation companies as well. So we involved all the stakeholders from, for our simulation model building process. And our simulation model was built in the Sumo in this case, but this Sumo can be also replaced to other simulation software. Uh, but in this case, the Sumo, we define the traffic demand. We follow the traffic demand modeling process. And in this case, we have different type of elements as a pedestrian, cyclists, and the public transportation and other type of vehicles as well. So this kind of variables uh, and the element was defined in our simulation model. And we ha also have internal verification and we also valid our assumption was right or not with the st different stakeholders. And we got the quantitative result from the simulation model, but the simulation result is just like a bunch of uh, the numbers uh, or some tables like that. So we had some post-processing, pro the post-processing to make, a, make our simulation result as a visible. So we use some libraries to visualize our data uh, with, as a chart, or we, we also use some kind of geographic based uh, visualization tools as well. And this data can be can, uh, sent to the stakeholders to uh, validate our research and to help their decision-making process. And this is not only for the single process, but it was the more like an iterative process to uh, improve our simulation model and validate our simulations. So this is all of our stories and I would like to uh, finish our simulation, uh, the story for this work mobile project. And if you have any questions, you can just contact us. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot attend the meeting after lunch. So just uh, you can send an email or some message to me uh, to get some answers. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much, Jake, uh, for your presentation. And now it's time to uh, move on. And it's Market Kutta from Aalto University about public participation and lifestyles of residents. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Marketa Kytta from Aalto University, where I work as professor of land use planning in School of Engineering. In this hub mobile project in Aalto, um, uh, our group has included also uh, Samira Ramezani, uh, Zundan Tan, and Leila Soilio. Today, I am uh, talking about the use of public participation GIS approach, uh, both in Hub Mobile project and a bit in also more generally. So, um, you all know that the traditional ways of uh, gathering knowledge from people in transportation planning processes or uh, urban planning projects. Uh, uh, are there are quite a few uh, ways to gather knowledge, but uh, the problem typically is that these uh, methods typically more or less uh, give us only verbal feedback from people about their living environments regarding, for example, accessibility or uh, tra trans traffic safety. The, the problem is that this kind of knowledge is not easy to apply in planning. So for this reason, in my team, we have developed already since 15 years, a new uh, methodological approach. That is uh, an example of public participation GIS methodology. And here, the idea is that uh, we collect uh, knowledge from people's behavior and experiences place-based so that this knowledge is, is clearly attached to the physical environmental um, or physical settings. And, uh, and this way we can actually also uh, create a whole new knowledge layer. We called it originally SoftKiss uh, knowledge layer on top of the knowledge layers that, 
that the uh, geographic information system is all about concerning the physical and social uh, structural characteristics of settings. And, and why would this be important, this uh, attaching the knowledge uh, to places? Well, first of all, it uh, provides wonderful uh, opportunities for transactional place-based research um, and, and a, a ability to really uh, study the associations between experiential or behavioral layer of information with all those other layers of knowledge, but also perhaps a, a good uh, approach to participatory planning. And, and this methodology uh, has been developed to a whole service where anyone can create a place-based survey they themselves, collect data online using mobile devices, computers, and then also um, uh, share or, or includes tools for um, easy analysis. Here, the tool, Mapsioner tool, has, is used in Netherlands. Uh, the, the commercialized version of our in, innovation is really called Mapsioner, and it has been used in more than uh, 35 countries, and there have been more than one, uh, more than 10,000 projects already around the world. In HubMobile, this, this approach, this methodology was used to identify various uh, user groups uh, in city of Turku. And we uh, were able to identify four different personas. We call them process sustainable urbanites, time conscious urbanites, multimodal price conscious residents, and auto oriented residents. We also uh, studied whether the perceived uh, health and perceived quality of life of these groups differed. And we found that process that sustainable urbanites had the highest perceived health while auto oriented the lowest. But when we studied uh, perceived quality of life, the results were a little bit different and a bit contradictory because time-conscious suburbanites had highest quality of life while processed and sustainable urbanites the lowest. And this uh, contradiction clearly needs more research in the future. In city of Turku, we also studied how future mobility solutions to Turku Harbor uh, perhaps uh, would interest in different ways these different personas and we found that the uh, pro sustainable urbanites and the multimodal price conscious uh, uh, residents uh, were the most likely uh, types of residents who might be interested in new sustainable mobility uh, solutions in, in Turku harbor. Uh, let me finally take a little look how this uh, public participation GIS methodology has been used in um, real life public participation projects around the world in transportation planning. There are very interesting cases uh, from uh, New Zealand to um, US, this case is from um, uh, San Jose, if I remember correctly, uh, all the way to New York, where uh, one of the largest uh, maps and air studies has been realized in uh, to support the citywide transit plan. Uh, in city of Helsinki, they also realized a very interesting place where project where people were uh, marking their everyday routes and at the same time they also marked unpleasant places along everyday routes and, and this map surely shows us which are the most urgent uh, places in city center Helsinki that would uh, demand some attention. 
uh, people also in Helsinki provided over 800 ideas how to uh, how to improve the transportation um, settings uh, from the everyday life perspective of people. If you are interested to learn more about uh, other user cases, take a look at uh, the web pages of Mapsionaire. And if you are interested uh, more in the Turbo case, uh, please visit our Hub Mobile uh, pages. There is a lot. Uh, there are several publications about Turku project. Uh, when I have now explained you something about this uh, online public participation uh, GIS methodology, let me remind you that, of course, this is not the only method that is uh, usable in uh, modern public participation. There are lots of different tools that can be uh, categorized to, uh, for example, four different categories uh, based on whether they support uh, large-scale participation uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the one hand or deeper, uh, more intensive collaboration in smaller groups or uh, that are typically solution-seeking. Um, and in fact, also you can uh, think about whether these methods are um, targeted to, to uh, get uh, provide us diverging new knowledge or whether it is a question about converging all different knowledge um, um, layers together. So based on these two axes, um, uh, you can categorize four types of uh, methods that are clearly all needed in different phases of planning process. There are times in planning process where you have to open up to new large scale knowledge, but also times when you need to converge uh, knowledge to, to solutions. So uh, later, Kristap uh, Kaugurs will tell you more about a very variety of methods that fall to these different categories that have the can there can can have their own ways of supporting public participation and stakeholder engagement. This was all from me today. Uh, I'm happy to discuss with you more about these topics after the lunch break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marketta. So, uh, as uh, Marketta already mentioned, uh, we'll continue with the presentation of Christoph Skauguros uh, about these participatory tools and how to improve and enrich your stakeholder engagement processes. So, uh, Christophs, uh, the um, floor is let, yours. Thank you. Um, let me first share my screen. And uh, okay, now you should have it. And uh, well, let's go on. So uh, as Stefan Marketa already introduced me. Uh, my name is Christoph Skalgurs, and today I'm coming to you with the story of, uh, or let's say I will start with origin story of uh, our participatory planning toolkit. And the story is about how to improve and enrich your stakeholder engagement processes. Uh, it's a result of, of teamwork from mixture of Riga team and Alto University team. From Riga, it is me, my colleague Inga, and uh, Viktoria Prilenska. Um, and from Alto University, the former presentation um, a presenter, Marketa, and her colleague Tan Zuran Xundran. Um, Okay, so I would like to go through this origin, origin story of the toolkit. How did we come to it? So how it all started? Um, it all started with the original project goals of the Hoppenwell project that most of you who have 
been involved in the project scene seem as or in the, identify as very um, um, known and, and well seen. So improvement of stakeholder processes, co-creation with residents, aiding creation of stakeholder engagement plans, framework building, policy guidelines building, etc. Um, a typical stakeholder engagement and public participation process, as we all know, goes through the initiation phase, planning and design phase, implementation phase, maintenance, evaluation and research phases. And, the, and uh, uh, the key decisions are usually made early in the process in planning and decision, uh, designing phase. And the uh, problem statements are set in the beginning. And the problem or typical problem or typical point of public participation, which is set by legal bare minimum, is usually done right after everything has been designed and just before it start, is beginning to implement. On some occasions, of course, uh, it uh, reaches out to, to this co-creation phase a little bit earlier, but that is not that uh, often seen. However, the project and, and all of our team is uh, um, advocating this holistic approach of stakeholder engagement and co-creation process, which should be a good mixture of tools and resources, how to involve people throughout all of these five project phases. However, so it's well known process and, and uh, so we got, got on with our tasks. Uh, we, we set out um, describing national legislative frameworks and the bare minimums that are set out in the legal, uh, legal requirements. Um, the state of uh, partner stakeholder engagement and culture was mapped out and the, all of the practices were identified. So we, we also set up a solid stakeholder engagement framework. And then of course, of course, this happened. So um, in many cases, this is uh, where, where um, a lot of complications come in. And, and it's fair to say that it was the same situation for us. Initially we waited, but, um, but then of course, in, at one point we understood that there are a lot of challenges raising up. There's a participatory urban planning is largely face-to-face -face process. It includes a lot of meetings and a lot of requirement to interact with people. Uh, we saw that everybody is adapting as they can. They uh, are improvising and in, 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 uh, in the social including process. Uh, They're trying out new digital tools to adapt to their um, legal requirements, skipping on non essentials. So we saw the requirement of, of, uh, of this uh, need rising. Uh, at that point, we, we were already well on the way in our, our um, methodology, which is defining your goals in the five easy steps, then knowing your stakeholders, then choosing a method that we were already starting out to describe, and engaging stakeholders, collecting data, and evaluating this. But out of our research and, and uh, pre-prep work, we identified that the most of the challenges come especially in this third step in choosing the right method, especially in this uh, era of, um, of innovation where everybody needs to adapt their practices. So um, a right um, methodolo methodological framework or explanation was needed. So we were back at the, uh, at the drawing board with re redefinition of the goals, the need of participatory planning toolkit was clear on the table. So we had to create something or we saw that we need to create something that makes choosing the right methods for your project needs fast and easy. It should be simple for, simple for searching. It should be uh, a good advanced sorting and selection me uh, mechanism behind it. Uh, for all of the methods, it should include some kind of uh, description of the methodology. How do you use that tool? 
and what expected outcomes could come out of it. Where do you apply it in mobility planning or et cetera? It should have some good mixture from what we already know of the face-to-face -face methods, analog tools, so to say, but it should especially focus or include the selection of digital remote tools that we are all experimenting with these days, especially at the beginning of, of COVID restrictions and limitations. And of course, the feedback would be nice, nice option to have. Um, it should be something that makes the this navigation of universe of participatory planning methods somewhat simpler, some, somewhat easier to do. So um, with all that in mind, we set out to create a go-to resource for participation, for practice, practitioners, for our project Hotmobile to use, and hopefully for everybody else after this. So this is exactly what we set out to do. So we created this uh, tool collection of tools, what we like to call, uh, call a participatory planning toolbox. You can find it online uh, by typing in this address, uh, participatory.tools, and this is what you get. It is a simplistic uh, center uh, or collection of what we all collected. It includes, of course, the national participation baseline and descriptions of all of this. It includes especially step-by-step -step descriptions on those five steps. How do you go through creating stakeholders engagement process for yourself? And it creates or gives you uh, an option to choose from variety of methods. We included 16 of uh, digital methods and 16 of well-known analog methods that are described, categorized, and uh, created for everybody to use on searching mechanisms, on different uh, selection criteria, and you can find and click through those and find preferably the best thing for your project to, to use. Um, to conclude our, um, our presentation, we have included some of the uh, selection criteria that are self-explanatory, self such as mode of communication, whether it's digital or analog, group size, geographical scope, whether you're planning something small or something big, a city or neighborhood, or maybe some small area around your place. Um, skills that are required, resources that are required both time-wise and money-wise, planning phase where, where you're at, but also some, some more difficult, uh, or let's say um, more, um, more uh, refined uh, criteria for such, such as planning phase, uh, level of stakeholders engagement, uh, and our fourfold classification uh, in, in this. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this because our, uh, our colleague Marquette already touched on those, but I just wanted to, um, to conclude, I'm sorry for the missing uh, or jumping over the, the texts. But with all of this, we want to, to step one step closer to, to our common goal, which was not only to create this search box for everyday practitioners to use, but also to promote an easy way how to enrich and uh, make your practices better, enrich your process of public participation, to make your life easier to, to uh, um, select appropriate methods and use them accordingly on each step of your public, uh, of your project and each uh, phase of, or each goal accordingly. So with that, I'm saying thank you to everybody who were 
following me through this uh, origin story. I hope that this tool helps you out in your everyday endeavors and professional uh, requirements of other projects well after the Help Mobile project is ended. So with that hope in mind, thank you everybody. And um, thank you for this opportunity to present our results. Thank you very much, Christophs. Uh, that was very inspiring. And, and I truly uh, suggest everyone to go and look at it uh, after this final seminar and after the project, because they are definitely a very good selection of uh, tools that are modern and you could uh, think of how to apply them yourself in your own city and organization. But uh, we are behind a little bit behind the schedule. So please, uh, Inga from Riga, could you uh, continue about lifestyle of grassroots initiative integrated green water transport in Riga. Yes, we can see your screen. But you're still muted. Yeah, uh, hello everyone again. I'm Inga from the Riga Energy Agency. And um, just Picking up from the previous speakers about the participatory, uh, participatory processes, uh, I would like to uh, say that the um, Homebell project is not only about the uh, concrete innovations and results, but it's uh, a lot about the capacity building by learning from the others and sharing uh, what we are doing. Uh, so I will not share with you the concrete results and numeric results, but I will rather tell a story about the participation, how a grassroots initiative uh, has been picked up and uh, yeah, on, the, on its way to implementation. Uh, so when we started the Humabel project, uh, we had uh, defined uh, very ambitious aims and, and um, because we, our chosen pilot, terri uh, pilot territory, the Freeport of uh, Riga, is, takes uh, a large, large place in our city, in a very central place, and it's a backbone of the city's economy, so it's very important. But of course, it's in a way uh, creates in inconveniences also for the residents. So all these issues are so complex that uh, no one can uh, solve them by, by itself, nor part, nor municipality, nor the citizens, of course. So we aim to, to pro, uh, develop proposals for uh, how to improve the urban mobility, how to ensure the emission-free uh, mobility, uh, how to relieve the city center from port-related traffic and reduce uh, CO2 emissions, how to uh, promote uh, shifting uh, transport transportation modes, how to uh, convince people to change the, the cars for more environmentally friendly solutions. Uh, Sorry, very... Inga, could you please change into full screen mode so that we can also see the slides? Uh, I haven't I done it. Sorry, um, it doesn't work. I have it on my screen. I have no idea why it's not on. So you probably need to click on the other screen, the icons, so it's easier for us to see. That would be simplest at this point. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> now you see. 
Do you see it now? We see the second slide, not in the present review, but it doesn't matter as long as we see the slide. So if you just please yes. then. Yes. I don't Thank know you. for what for reason. Uh, I had it on my screen, uh, the presentation mode, but it doesn't work when, when sharing. So I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I will, I will continue like this. Uh, so we have these very bold, uh, wor uh, uh, bold aims with bold and right uh, words. But what does it really mean uh, for for uh, a citizen of Riga, and, and what can we do? Uh, so let me go back to the history a little bit. Uh, Riga and the port uh, have been closely related uh, since uh, 13th century. Uh, so and. As uh, water takes, uh, as I found the number of 16% of the city's territories nowadays, and Riga is kind of evenly spread on, on both sides of the river. So uh, you can see that uh, boats have uh, always played important role in uh, connecting uh, people uh, from both uh, banks of the river. Uh, especially before the bridges were you know, installed. Uh, nowadays we have five bridges, but it's still not enough to, to ensure the smooth uh, traffic uh, from one city side to the other. Um, so uh, therefore from time to time, it's, it's always these discussions that are coming up how, how to improve connections of two sides of the city. And in uh, 2018, the Riga City Architects Office um, um, started, the, uh, they launched a public conference on uh, relationship between the C Riga citizens and the port, uh, where they, these ideas on uh, developing water transportation have been brought up. Uh, discussion uh, was uh, continued in 2019. Uh, already uh, defining uh, uh, development of water transport as, as a part of public transportation. Uh, so, but um, um, as, a, as I said, no single stakeholder can manage uh, uh, on uh, solving the, the, the issues, uh, problems itself. And in order to implement such an idea, we need to pull uh, together the, the, all the resources and come together. Uh, so um, we took the advantage of Hoopmobile project, which pro uh, provides this holistic approach. And so we kind of picked the grassroots initiative and uh, continued uh, uh, already discussions with, with uh, stakeholders uh, mainly the port authority and uh, the uh, Riga city neighborhoods. Uh, so, uh, like we we have all the all the prerequisites falling together. There are needs uh, of citizens and, and wishes to have the water transportation. There are needs for of the ports companies to to ensure the connection between the two sides of the river. There are needs of the city to improve the, the water banks uh, and, and also to think about the transformation of the, the poor territories, the former poor territories that, that are the activities that have been transferred to the other, other out, outside the city center. Uh, so, and we even have a company that is on own private initiative already constructing the boat that could ensure the uh, passenger uh, transportation. Uh, so, yeah, and once again, stating the holistic approach, the Hookmobile project has allowed us to, to go forward with the idea. And so we kind of crystallized uh, the, these bold uh, aims uh, uh, into, into very concrete uh, proposals. And we commissioned two mobility management studies, uh, uh, one uh, on the vision and proposals for management model for development of low emission water transport in, in Riga, and the other one, uh, development of potential opportunities of integrated low emission water transport in the uh, territory of Riga, uh, and uh, meaning the, the 
already proposals of concrete uh, roads and, 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 and uh, traffic frequency. Uh, so we, we have uh, the both studies are just uh, finished. We are about to present the results um, to the to the wider public, as well as now we, we uh, take this opportunity to um, put forward the results to the to uh, our decision makers, so that the idea from grassroots going through the processes have, has come uh, so far that um, actually there is already a, a possibility to discuss the concrete sets of uh, recommendations, uh, both on um, regulation, regula regulatory framework, on necessary uh, legislation changes, on necessary in investments that are needed, and also on, on uh, concrete uh, uh, scenarios of uh, develop, developing a passenger uh, water transport integrated in the public transport system of the city of Riga, uh, meaning the providing connections with other uh, modes of transport, buses and, and trams and trains, and also developing the mobility point uh, concepts that, that we have um, elaborated uh, within uh, other previous uh, uh, mobility projects in, in Riga. Uh, so, um, so uh, just let me just conclude that uh, I will quote uh, or rephrase the, the quote of uh, uh, city's architect um, um, said in November 2018, uh, let's make Riga boatable again. I will in November 2021, or today it's already 1st of December, I will say we will make Riga boatable again. So thank you. And um, yeah, the questions will be in the afternoon. Thank you very much, Inga, and we'll just wait and see in which year you will say uh, Riga is boatable again. But now uh, it's time to move on, and next we have um, Maria uh, Rannama from the uh, ITL Digital Labs telling us about building cross-sectional ITS networks in BSR region. Sorry, I will open my presentation now. So, hi everyone from ITL Digital Lab side and uh, from ITS Estonia Network. So, I will very shortly introduce you a small part of a Hubmobile project, but I think it, it has been an important part when thinking of the future. Um, uh, in order to uh, support the collaboration and uh, building of the cross-sectoral competencies. Uh, uh, it is important to match the, the public sector challenges with private sector uh, solutions. And this is the reason why in the Hopmobile, Hopmobile project we planned uh, uh, building uh, cross-sectoral ITS networks. Uh, this uh, objective we plan to uh, achieve uh, through um, uh, several uh, networking events. We planned actually five plus one, uh, five uh, smaller scale uh, networking seminars plus one larger conference. But as you all know, the COVID times uh, uh, came and this larger scale conference uh, got uh, problematic, how to say. But uh, I'm really happy to say that actually we achieved even more. And we, instead of organizing a separate conference by ourselves, uh, we joined the forces with already happening bigger events like ITS European Congress and ITS World Congress. And actually we achieved a, a bigger number of, of participation of stakeholders than we actually planned. So instead of six events, we even organized uh, eight. And when we're going over the events, then uh, uh, it started with, with the first seminar in Tallinn. 
And, and then we already understood that it would be important to uh, move the activities there where the participants are already present. So the next uh, event took place uh, during ITS European Congress in Eindhoven. And actually, I have a great picture from the Finnish Estonian uh, stand where we had a large scale networking event. And uh, there were present uh, public sector uh, stakeholders like ministries, ministries uh, cities, uh, universities, but also a lot of private sector representatives. And uh, this was uh, one of uh, one great event uh, in the beginning of the project. When going back to, uh, uh, to the list of the events, then we can see that we managed to organize the several other. And uh, in February 2020, right before the lockdown, we managed to organize the one event in Tartu, where the uh, Tartu University uh, introduced to different uh, participants uh, their uh, research topics uh, in the field of ITS. And there were matching of the topics with the private sector needs. And also uh, the vice mayor of Tartu, Mr. Ayman Tam, uh, made a great presentation about the biggest challenges of Tartu city uh, in the field of transport and mobility. And, and I'm happy to say that there were over 34 participants. And then the COVID time actually started. And uh, I think uh, networking, uh, it is much easier to do it on live face to face than uh, in uh, web format. But still, we, we went on with the activities and organized several webinars. And uh, one of the events uh, that I'm really happy of is uh, one joint uh, cocktail party <laughs> uh, that we had uh, for the national ITS associations. And I'm happy to say that there were uh, 14 different European countries uh, present. And there were the heads of the ITS uh, national networks. Uh, ITS national networks are organizations where there are already public and private sector included into the same network. So, so we took all these uh, participants together and organized one joint uh, event in order to strengthen the connections between the parties. And then uh, after several web-based events, we were really happy that this September we managed to organize one real large-scale networking event in Riga. And why in Riga, actually, uh, I have to say that uh, Nordic countries and also uh, other uh, central, um, like uh, Baltic Sea region countries, have been quite active in this ITS field. But Latvia is one of the few countries where there is no ITS Latvia network currently. And we were really happy to work with a Latvian ICT cluster to find relevant stakeholders also from Latvia. Uh, I'm really happy to say that the interest from Latvian side towards collaboration in the field of ITS were really high. So altogether from different countries, we had 66 participants uh, and uh, Riga City, uh, uh, Latvian transport ministry representatives, but also from Estonian side, city and, and uh, ministry uh, presented their challenges all, and also the companies had the uh, opportunity to uh, pitch their solutions uh, to these challenges. And uh, as a feedback to this event, what is really funny that several Latvian companies uh, wrote uh, to me after this event and uh, say thank you for organizing the event. Finally, I got uh, contact with Riga City. So, so as you can see, these uh, networks are, are not as natural everywhere as, as we think they are. Um, and, uh, and I'm really happy to say that after this event, uh, the decision has been made that there will be ITS Latvia network uh, also, uh, which is right now under development. So I, I think this is an important uh, uh, outcome of, of the current project and this concrete event. And uh, our final element uh, that I'm really happy for was that uh, the first large scale Congress in the field of ITS took place this year in Hamburg. And we managed to organize uh, a really great networking event uh, in the Nordic plus stand. Uh, with a lot of stakeholders involved. 
And very shortly, these were just the overview of some of the events that we organized in order to match the, the public and private sector needs. But, uh, but uh, uh, what is important is that um, uh, uh, there is strong need for uh, private sector to bring, uh, 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 for public sector to bring their so to their um, their challenges to the table of, of near neutral stakeholders, and also there is strong need from private sector and also R and D university side to collect these challenges and offer new solutions or or uh, develop their products based on based on these challenges. And I think these kind of networking activities are strongly supporting this kind of collaboration. I'm really happy to, to say that after the project, uh, there is much stronger collaboration between the ITS networks in, in the BSR region, especially in Nordic countries. There is this Nordic plus collaboration uh, right now on, on BART. Uh, and I'm really happy to say that uh, also in Latvia, these uh, things are happening finally. And I'm really looking forward to see a strong ITS Latvia network also. Uh, I have to say that it, what's important is that there is more trust between the different stakeholders and the person know, persons know how, who to turn to. And also there are some concrete pilot projects that uh, initiatives that has grown out of the events uh, like uh, on demand based autonomous uh, last mile prototype building in, in Ulamiste city and, and many others actually. And also there has been first steps to move jointly towards higher level R&D activities like Horizon Europe, but, uh, but also Interreg. So uh, this kind of networking doesn't seem um, uh, big, but I think it is an important part and should be, uh, should be a part in, in most of these kind of uh, uh, thematic projects. And uh, if you want to have collaboration with uh, Estonian stakeholders in the field of ITS, then uh, please don't hesitate to contact me and I'm really happy to uh, put you in connection with public or private sector stakeholders. Thank you from my side. Thank you very much, Maria. And we continue with uh, ITL Digital Lab. And now we have uh, Ralph Martin Soe telling us about mini pilot case examples uh, from the our BSR cities. Yes, so first of all, I'm very honored uh, to be here and also a part of this project and, and, uh, and as a participant in this project from uh, early on, uh, it has been very nice uh, conference or seminar so far with very good reflections back uh, to how we started. And, uh, and thank you already in once for Alto University for coordinating uh, all of this. Uh, and also it was very nice uh, to see uh, how uh, Riga was willing to uh, host us uh, throughout the people working in the realm and, and also a very nice keynote uh, speech uh, from uh, uh, Sami Sahara from Forum Virum Helsinki that was really kind of putting it into a nice research and innovation context. And, and that is also something that uh, has very much influenced uh, this project as such, uh, because this agile piloting concept as such, uh, like has some roots in Forum Virum Helsinki as well. And, and they are, I would say, world uh, leading players in that field and helped uh, us uh, throughout the process uh, a bit as well to design it. Uh, uh, but as we are very limited in time, I will jump into the um, uh, presentation. And, and so uh, 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 our role here has been to really uh, work with cities um, in, in, uh, in, in a more kind of ex experiment experimental way, uh, how to introduce uh, novel ideas and especially like uh, IT best based ideas. Uh, and as you can see, this ITS uh, field and network has pushed it uh, very nicely. And thank you already for Maria as well uh, for, for that kind of uh, uh, coordination and lead uh, from her side uh, that you just listened to. Uh, but, uh, but really, like if you we, if we go back uh, three, four times, three, three, four years uh, before we started, it really has uh, at least uh, in, in Estonia and in the Baltic Sea region both uh, quite nicely uh, grown uh, as, as a field. And which is like pretty much the entire goal of, of uh, work package four. Um, and now uh, 
Um, uh, also part of that is that, uh, that maybe uh, what we have seen and also like now uh, like piloted several times by Forum Virum Helsinki, but also by, by other like four uh, uh, running cities like Amsterdam and now also by UN Habitant and several uh, Swedish player, players. The idea is that, uh, that if you want to bring new ideas uh, that are IT or automation or robotics based uh, into the city streets, uh, uh, then uh, agile approach sometimes uh, helps a lot. Uh, uh, just testing it out uh, either through the kind of uh, research phase or when in, in, in some kind of phase before large scale implementation. And that's the core idea of, of mini pilots as well, but, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and part of, of this uh, uh, activity here to help uh, cities to bring their ideas uh, to the city streets and really test, test them out. Uh, so my mini pilots themselves are quite small, so like uh, 20,000 uh, as investments, uh, as uh, outsourcing, but obviously like, uh, like there are very many support activities as well that has happened within the project. Uh, and the logic there is that they really like, uh, like uh, quickly develop a concept or prototype and, and test it out in, uh, in a city uh, actual uh, context and, and test it with free uh, people and, and stakeholders as well. And we have been coordinating it and we're very happy that all the four cities participated in as well and, and has been very fruitful collaboration. Uh, thank you uh, all the cities uh, for, for your very valuable uh, participation. And I'm also very grateful that initially we planned to have uh, two mini pilots implemented. Uh, and then uh, at some point uh, we managed to increase the number to four. But we, invent, uh, we ended up uh, with four ideas for uh, mini pilots, but uh, three implementations. Uh, so I will walk them through as well. So this is my main concept. Uh, and and uh, and uh, we have like I, I just saw that uh, that uh, or we have just drafted a report based on this as well, which actually excludes uh, Hamburg's mini pilot uh, as it is another deliverable, but just uh, write up uh, on on the mini pilot's concept uh, and and what we have been doing in Tallinn and uh, and and Turku and, and on the broader level in Hamburg and. Uh, and, uh, and Riga as well uh, is something that we have very briefly drafted and it will be on the website uh, soon as well. But if some of you has already now interest in this, uh, when, uh, when we can share the draft already now because it's getting quite close to the final. But, uh, but now I will walk through uh, the mini pilots, uh, but not in detail because um, uh, uh, otherwise uh, it would take uh, too much time. Uh, but so we started with a mini pilot in Hamburg uh, that aims to build those uh, mobility micro hubs uh, within the city. And so the main problem there is that, uh, that and as it is in very many European cities and, and politics region cities, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, there's a lot of goods delivery, especially in the congested uh, areas like uh, train stations, uh, and uh, with the introduction of, uh, of uh, cargo traffic based on uh, bikes, uh, it's possible to reduce uh, motorized uh, cargo traffic, uh, which is very often also annoying because it's, it's parking on the bicycle and, and pedestrian uh, streets. And for us, for this already in 2020, jointly with uh, Deutsche Bahn uh, Smart City, Hamburg uh, dedicated one space of around 80 square meters area uh, uh, for uh, this uh, micro hub. Uh, uh, second mini pilot, uh, which is actually combined with uh, pre feasibility study uh, on adaptable traffic lights, uh, was conducted in, in Tallinn and, and Leave are actually in the following presentation. Also, part of Work Package 4 will uh, introduce this feasibility study. So, I will not go uh, into depth with that. Uh, but, uh, but uh, it was very nice that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the study included this mini pilot as well. And that is something as a concept, uh, very valuable, because very often you get those feasibility studies that are 400 pages. In this case, it's, it's 50 or 60 pages. The page is not that big, but in very often you get very detailed feasibility studies, but there's no at all experimentation. It's all pure computation and, and, and based on simulations and assumptions. 
But if you could bring in uh, some kind of actual test, uh, how the technology works, uh, it, it is very valuable. And in this case, uh, uh, we had uh, one in one crossing in the northern part of Tallinn, uh, we had this mini pilot up and live this summer for one month in live traffic. And on the graph here, you can see that, uh, that uh, this shows uh, the tram connection between two uh, tram stops, uh, Maleva and Sitsi, that uh, before introduction of adaptive traffic lights and after that, uh, uh, the time that they took for the tram uh, was shortened. And it didn't uh, uh, cause any big uh, traffic issues for the private cars as well. So it, it went on quite smoothly, but also in the report, you can read about uh, the technology as such and, uh, and barriers and neighbors to that. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very nice and very sophisticated uh, report and the pilot itself uh, uh, with partners of Civita and Stratum uh, that helped you conduct it. Uh, then uh, in Turku, uh, uh, city of Turku uh, then conducted the registration plate study uh, but Jenna already mentioned uh, in the beginning as well in her presentation, and uh, and uh, and uh, that uh, is very nicely aligned with uh, actual uh, participatory process uh, from a city uh, government perspective, because in a very broader kind of discussion debate, uh, uh, it has been decided that uh, the central bridge. Uh, uh, should limit uh, uh, through uh, put traffic uh, of private cars and, uh, and and really it should be as a goal only for car travel to and from the city city center and, and then uh, this registration plate study with actual uh, mini pilot implemented then um, is, is a good tool for that uh, uh, because uh, uh, it, it really helps to identify uh, number of vehicles passing passing through volume be, be, between the measuring points and, and here on the picture you can see one measuring points but there were uh, more than one of them and the logic there is that, uh, that, uh, that uh, with measuring points you can is estimate uh, that if it's the same license plate uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, one time frame uh, passing through on one measuring point to the other one then you can say that okay or you can assume that this is uh, very probably uh, throughput traffic uh, that, that you want to limit. But it also indicated uh, like uh, the types of vehicles and also registration address and hourly distribution. And as, as a result, uh, like, uh, like uh, there's more in, in the report, uh, but, uh, but as, a, as a result, 50% uh, of vehicles uh, were registered in Turku. And, uh, and there were approximately 20% total volume passing, passing traffic. So uh, the picture is, is, is quite good. Uh, although thanks to COVID as well, uh, thanks to COVID in this case, uh, the challenge uh, like when it was implemented was a bit smoother when uh, due to the pre-COVID time. And, uh, and in general, it was 90% of passenger uh, cars and then there was estimation of type as well. There was petrol, sorry, it should be one no diesel or, or, or hybrid cars. Uh, although, like if, if you if if you read in the report as well, uh, this technology as such is also very important to understand on what conditions it works and on what conditions it doesn't work. And uh, and obviously, the license plate recognition is never one hundred percent accurate. I think in in this case it was more than ninety percent accurate. But very often nowadays, as you could see from Riga's video as well, that it's if it's snowing and if it's heavy snow and so so on, there can be. Uh, uh, impact uh, from that as well. And in the case of Riga, uh, uh, we have developing the concept for a mini pilot uh, throughout the project. Uh, and, uh, and and it really was uh, supposed to deal with, uh, with, uh, with smart mobility solution of uh, Freeport of Riga. And, uh, and, uh, and it was very nice uh, design because it was purely uh, meant to be managed and implemented by university students uh, throughout the competition and city and port and students already started collaborating. And, 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 and even in uh, September this year, uh, we, were in, we were still in a position to deliver it. But unfortunately, uh, the city was, was, was very difficultly hit uh, first of all, by structural changes within the management of city uh, and the port as well, but the port uh, authorship or ownership was transferred from uh, from a city to a government, and that brought several issues. 
uh, from administrative perspective. And then later this COVID influenced it a lot because uh, the time when we wanted to start the mini pilot, uh, uh, full country lockdown uh, was implemented and, uh, and, uh, and that really kind of seized the plan as such. Although uh, we have managed to, uh, to design it and I said, uh, we're very happy uh, that we managed to carry through uh, three mini pilots, although the initial plan was four, so we have uh, exceeded it. And now I can pass it on uh, to Tero uh, and then probably to Lever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph. And now it's uh, Livar Lutz uh, from the city of Tallinn, hello, uh, telling us about adaptive traffic lights and mobility management. Yes, uh, this is a second, I'm trying to share my screen. So, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Very good. And in full screen mode, so. Yes. OK, very good. So uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. So my name is uh, Lee Lutz, and I'm uh, uh, representing uh, City of Tallinn in, uh, uh, in Hub Mobile project. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, um, uh, Ralph made very good uh, introduction uh, about uh, the uh, innovative aspects of, uh, of uh, procurements and uh, mini piloting and uh, so this is the good basis to continue what we have what we did uh, in, in hot mobile project uh, uh, in city of Tallinn and uh, our approach was a bit uh, more practical uh, and as uh, Ralph Orland mentioned the outcome as the as the result uh, uh, of the study was not long, uh, uh, long and very many pages uh, of uh, report rather than just very practical uh, input for the city of Tallinn to plan further activities and also uh, uh, very interesting to read uh, for the other cities as well uh, uh, and, uh, and look the experience. So uh, yes, uh, I have been working with the city of Tallinn with different EU projects, mainly related with cross-border services, uh, communications, uh, uh, and projects related with uh, um, uh, with the people's movement, uh, Tallinn and Helsinki, uh, uh, and uh, further on. So I will. I just skipped one few very generic. Uh, slides as we are facing some delays of the agenda so i will try to be as, uh, as short as possible so going further uh, uh, I just took, uh, yes so the the objective of tallinn uh, uh, use case was uh, in condition where we have increased traffic and uh, the numbers of cars are growing and there is a quite high demand of uh, of uh, uh, well-functioning uh, uh, public transport, so we decided in in uh, in, uh, in the hub well framework to uh, try to uh, look into deep how we can uh, increase the mobility flows using the electronic solutions and promoting the switch towards the public and green and transport. It's very important to mention that it's increased the mobility flows. Uh, you can say that we are also wishing to increase the car uh, um, flows. It's uh, half true, half uh, not true uh, in, the, in the position where cities and especially Italian as well, we are narrowing uh, streets for the cars and uh, giving more space for the, uh, for the pedestrians and for the public transport. Uh, we, we, we need to find a balance uh, between uh, those. So it means that if uh, we are narrowing the uh, car traffic in the city, so we, we need to also uh, look uh, what we can do in, in terms of uh, mobility flows and how we can guide this. Uh, and, and also uh, just to give a more um, priority to uh, public transport as well. So uh, we decided to work out a brief feasibility study of adaptive traffic lights in, in case of the Baltic Sea region city Tallinn. And the idea was 
to try to look into this into this topic what the look what the other cities has done uh, near near here and also uh, idea is just to share the information to others as, well, as a good learning point so we aim to investigate the various adaptive traffic lights market solutions so what's currently on the market and what we can uh, uh, what we can integrate in City of Tallinn. Also, we have some fragments of adaptive traffic management in City of Tallinn, and the idea uh, within this uh, uh, study was also give us some audit of existing adaptive traffic system which we have in Tallinn, and also uh, to develop a sp specific hotspot uh, to validate the technologies in real traffic conditions. So this is basically the mini pilot which we had uh, during the, the feasibility study. So uh, going further or just evaluation of the Tallinn use case. So what we do, what we did uh, in advance. So we just look into the market, uh, look uh, what kind of options there are and uh, uh, how we can build up our uh, study. So we prepared the terms of reference and we decided to uh, go with the conventional uh, procurement process rather than uh, have, uh, for example, the innovative uh, procurement process. And it has paid a lot for us. So uh, we also discussed with the interested stakeholders and uh, interested parties what they think about it and how uh, they can commit uh, and we decided during the process that most efficient way is to uh, integrate the free feasibility study with the mini pilot in order to to uh, look uh, these uh, and test uh, these solutions which uh, can be uh, the best for the for the city of Tallinn. What challenge we faced during the, the process of the Tallinn use case was radical traffic behavior change. So it means that uh, sadly, as uh, all our previous speakers have said, that we had uh, during this um, hub mobile project, we had quite heavy lockdown. So it means that uh, there was a quite heavy uh, uh, degrees of uh, traffic uh, uh, and uh, it has influenced our uh, uh, study quite a lot. And we need to also uh, uh, ask uh, six months uh, uh, additional time uh, to carry out all the activities. So details about the free visibility study. Uh, so we did conventional benchmark study. Mm, we had uh, we we decided to uh, look into deep near nearby the city, which are quite similar to Tallinn, but still. Uh, so we just uh, looked uh, mm, uh, the Copenhagen, the Skopje, the Bilastok, and Tampere four cities uh, and how they manage with the traffic and how, what kind of components of adaptive traffic management they have. Mm, they were all using uh, some fragments of the uh, adaptive traffic management system and uh, all uh, these cities ha uh, have a system uh, as a prioritization for the uh, public transport, so quite a similar as it of Tallinn, and they are seeking uh, the further options uh, to uh, extend the system for the other mobility, uh, other means of transport as well. So then we analyze the investments and running costs, also the socio-economic cost, and this is particular for the city of Tallinn. So if we will implement the, uh, the adaptive traffic management in the city of Tallinn, how much does it cost and uh, what kind of influence it has. So also, which is a very important, the crucial the integration of the new technologies and transport modes. So uh, just seeking to the future that how the uh, traffic management should uh, communicate with different new technologies. Also, which was very important for us is the uh, auditing the existing radio roads, adaptive solution. Later on, I will just quickly show the picture and some information about that. And then we map the needed data layers, also map the potential corridors in Sitges Tallinn where we can implement the adaptive traffic management. And which was the final thing which was very important is the technical specification for the procurements. So if we are still after this study, we, we, we really uh, need to uh, procure the adaptive traffic management system, then which kind of requirements we should follow and which kind of specification. So this was also very important for us. So going uh, a more practical, so the Radio Road, Radio Road is a new road uh, in the city of Tallinn, mainly serving the uh, port traffic also for the city, but still is serving the port traffic inbound and outbound. And we have uh, um, 
uh, uh, this road, the road is ready. And also uh, in this road, we have an adaptive traffic management system, which is separate from the hub mobile project. And the idea was just to uh, have an audit and uh, to, to assess uh, uh, is this uh, solution best for the city and what kind of shortcomings there, there were. And we have like a smart learning, uh, self-learning traffic lights in this uh, road, then also the dynamic traffic management system and, uh, and the uh, variable method science. So, so the audit said in, in very uh, short uh, that uh, uh, the system which we, we, we procured was uh, um, set up quite hectically because we are lacking the experience. So it was good, that, good to know that we have some shortcomings there. Uh, also, it was uh, said that uh, these uh, sensors which we have, uh, uh, which we, we are, are having in this ready road, uh, are not suitable, so to say, and uh, it was it was very difficult due to the fact that the, the heavy uh, weather condition, uh, snow, uh, fog, etc., will influence directly the uh, the system. Uh, uh, capabilities so it means that uh, it's, it's also shortcoming so we need to figure out a better solution for the sensors and also the vms the variable message science they have uh, we have we have uh, these signs which are not very good seeable with the different angles so it means that this is also what to consider when uh, procuring and um, having these systems going further so the mini pilot, so we integrated uh, with the, uh, with the uh, feasibility study, the mini pilot. The idea was just to uh, look in real uh, traffic condition, how uh, uh, that, that traffic management can uh, uh, change the traffic situation and, uh, and look into deep. So we have just picked one quite a difficult uh, intersection in city of Tallinn, you can see on the map. Uh, so it's the uh, more, uh, so to say, west or south, uh, um, west, uh, north uh, of city of Tallinn, uh, uh, quite nearby the port still. Uh, and uh, so this is the H shape of, uh, of the intersection. And we will, uh, we have here the passing tram line. So in the red, you can see the tram line. So the, uh, the, our uh, the study uh, experts, uh, they uh, integrated the traffic cam uh, uh, thermal cameras into this intersection. And the idea of the mini pilot is uh, it, when we are using the adaptive traffic management, mainly saying that we are giving all the time green light for the tram passing the intersection, what kind of influence it has to the general uh, traffic and other uh, transport modes and how much we will gain in terms of time. Uh, so yeah, we set up different detectors, V detectors, thermal detectors and uh, buttons. Then we use the smart intersection software for that. Uh, the aim is to have a prioritization for the public transport and not waste the green time, so to say. Uh, uh, and here are the results. So it's, it's, it was really, really good experience for us because the total waiting time for cars was smaller than before, firstly. Secondly, uh, there was a much better distribution between different directions. Uh, and uh, just on the right side, you see how much uh, of seconds we gain uh, in each uh, uh, tram. So it means that when the city have set uh, the, the very uh, very big goal as, as uh, increasing the public transport uh, average speed and, uh, and to make the uh, public transport quicker. So uh, this study showed directly that having uh, adaptive traffic management in the city, uh, for example, for the trams or public transport, will increase the average speed of the public transport and also will uh, uh, make them, uh, uh, the traffic more smoother. And the only drawback, drawback of, the, of the study was, or the minor mini pilot was that the, the pedestrians must push the button. So before we, they didn't have to push the button and it was like automatically operated. But uh, during this uh, mini pilot that they had to do it and it was confusing and quite, uh, uh, they were quite angry as well. So very good uh, feedback for us as well. So when just results in a nutshell. So the benchmark cities have long-term experience very good to follow. Most likely we will continue to work with them and have a, have a good input and uh, also share the uh, experience what we have. 
Secondly, there is no like ready or end product for all cities. So it means that every city should start from case to case uh, of implementing the adaptive traffic management system. So it means that uh, this should be tailor made for all city. There is no ready product for, for uh, each city. Uh, also, the sensor information is very crucial. So basically, uh, we have used uh, the thermal cameras in our use case, but uh, uh, which is basically uh, good and not good. Good, it's very easy to uh, to install, but still there are some issues with uh, the weather conditions. So the snow, the fog, etc., and rain. So uh, the most convenient uh, sensor uh, option is still the induction sensors on the surface, but still they are not so long lasting as for example, the cameras. So also this is very uh, important to stress out uh, to follow the, the best sensor uh, solution for each city and the uh, climate zone. Uh, also, uh, the feasibility only is in heavy traffic corridors. So if there is like less traffic, then it's no point to uh, uh, to implement uh, the adaptive traffic management. And also, which is which was very in in interesting to see that there is no major increase of maintenance costs uh, compared to conventional uh, uh, traffic management system. Uh, and just to conclude, uh, what we have learned. Uh, it's quite essential and important and just to uh, uh, quite a uh, challenge uh, to which of tra um, uh, traffic user groups you are put, uh, having uh, the um, priority and which kind of uh, uh, user groups you are uh, uh, promoting and uh, uh, favoring in, uh, in uh, the mobi mobility management. This is a very big question. Also, the impact of road safety, if you are uh, implementing the adaptive traffic management system and it's totally different as it was be before, then it can cause a serious issues that people are uh, not following uh, the adaptive, tra uh, adaptive traffic management system. Also, the impact of the new technologies, so how the self-driving cars will start communi communicating with uh, the intersection and adaptive traffic management and the um, traffic lights. So we need to foresee that before just making a huge investments. Uh, uh, and also just to conclude, uh, this was very good learning, learning point for the city of Tallinn. We will continue anyways to uh, further. So we will uh, next up, uh, the task for us is to improve the tram connect connection between city center and airport. It's too slow. We need to figure out how to uh, uh, increase, the, uh, increase the speed of the tram. Uh, this report will be uh, uh, soon, hopefully tomorrow morning, uh, in the um, in our project web page, you can download it. it. Uh, and and also, if you have any further more questions, we can have uh, after the lunch. And this is just uh, a picture of a, a mobility management center or or uh, where the traffic is uh, managed in city of Tallinn in some very dark room. And that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lever, uh, for your presentation. And now we move and forward to the city of Hamburg and Heike Bunta will tell us about active mobility in port areas. Thank you so, so much, Tero. Thank you so much, Lever. I hope you can all see my presentation in the full screen now. As um, Tero already said, uh, I'm focusing on active mobility in port areas. Sorry, Heike, your presentation is not on the screen currently. Hmm. Okay. That is not good. Hang on. Can you see it now? Now we can see it. It's not yet in the presenter uh, mode, but we can now see your slides. Okay. So I try to get it on a full screen. If not, don't worry. Is it full screen now? No, is it? it no, it's not. But you see the presentation, right? 
Yes, we can see the presentation. Okay, yes. then I suggest in, because time is flying, we do it like this, if you don't mind, okay? So um, actually um, coming back to Hamburg, um, here we, with Hub Mobile, we really focused on um, active mobility, also in terms of ITS, Mars, and mobility management. Apart from that, um, it is important, and also we want to refer to port areas, and here not to underestimate the importance for active mobility in these areas. It's not a question of asking why, it's a question of asking how. Because at the moment, it's a fact that um, in most of the port areas, we are also dealing with 10T corridors. And we also need to focus on change on that and on the legislation. Because as you know, I mean, Sami uh, mentioned it and we all are heading for climate neutral cities. Uh, active mobility can highly contribute to it. And currently, 10T discussions or focusing on legislation needs impact that we introduce and that we uh, integrate active mobility into this uh, process. Um, actually, um, Jena already presented it very well, what happened in the harbor of, or in the port area of uh, Turku. So um, this is also something we highly contributed. And uh, in Hamburg, I ask myself here, um, what were the main aspects for Turku, for Riga and so on, um, if developing port areas and if developing active mobility, how successful are they in terms of that? How important do we set up this issue? Actually, here in Hamburg, we also tried to jump over the River Elbe or towards port areas because our cities grow, port areas at the same time also grow. So we also needed here new residential areas. And um, it is quite a while ago then that we already did this step. And it's quite a while ago that we involved many of our residents into this um, process. And it is also quite a while ago that we also used all this uh, mapping tools, worked with GIS, worked face-to-face -face, uh, in terms of developing these areas together. Because it is absolutely clear from the beginning that we have conflicts between typical industrial areas, so to say, and residential areas, if they come close together. So, um, of course, when you develop new zones, no new residential areas, you also have to develop new issues or um, new wine in old bottles, so to say. It is about climate neutral cities, it is about new lifestyles, it is about new metro zones. But um, we often forget what about transport, what about daily commuting. So also in this process, uh, we have forgotten to integrate active mobility in on the agenda of port areas and residential living. Nevertheless, it's not a new topic. We already cycled here in the 1920s, as you can see from this, from this historical picture through the harbor. We used bridges and tunnels as a main transport, a bottleneck. But we have forgotten about it. And often nowadays we hear it's not possible to integrate cycling and walking into port areas, it's too dangerous, um, it's too difficult to build the infrastructure. So we have in fact already a high diversity in terms of vehicles in our harbors, but nevertheless, 
because of uh, specific aspects, we do not approach a systematic view on it, which means that port authorities, of course, they focus on their economic aspects. They focus on the fact that the goods who are arriving in the port areas are going as fast as possible out of the port area into the countryside inland, so to say. Nevertheless, what we did is within Hub Mobile here, within our project, that we wanted to contribute to active mobility and we created an animation tool uh, for mainly for the target group of cyclists and pedestrians and public transport users. Um, and it is made for those who are thinking to cycle through the harbor, because in our case here in Hamburg, from this new residential area to the city center, it is just 2.5 kilometers and so much faster than public transport or uh, if you drive by car. So it's much more efficient, but of course, we know the concerns. It's that people say, oh, it might be too dangerous. And in terms of that, as a preparation, they can use this animation tool, they can click on it and things are popping up and things are explaining where to raise awareness, where, to, uh, where are weaknesses and where are strong points already towards active mobility. So it's a bit an interactive tool with information and um, we highlight in this animation tool aspects of safety for uh, active mobility, aspects also if it comes to intersections because this is known not only in port areas but also in the rest of the city, the main cause for accident. And as you can see, even if you provide safe, so-called safe or perceived safety for a cyclist, it is still a crucial aspect. But nevertheless, it needs to pay attention how to create good intersections um, and how to avoid conflicts between all these um, different users of transport modes. So actually, um, now come on. Um, it is necessary to create or raise awareness also towards education because um, Creating here 2.5 kilometers of new, completely new infrastructure takes ages in cities. It is really difficult to build infrastructure. It is really difficult to speed up this process. In the meantime, it is absolutely um, a good solution to raise awareness for different users and sharing the road. So you probably might know the example from New Zealand where they implemented a traffic education uh, training program for um, cyclists on one hand and uh, heavy vehicles uh, on the other hand. And it is quite accessible because um, you swap roads. So you experience the viewpoint from a different role and that helps to prevent um, accidents. Additionally on that, it is also important that you reduce uh, speed, for example, because as you can see, this is quite good, brilliant effort, very good for cycling, but uh, on the other hand, before that, we had here cobblestone, cobblestone, sorry. So cobblestone reduces the speed automatically also for car drivers. And now we have this perfect asphalt and what happens is that speed increased. So make sure that you control the system after you have built it. Make sure that people 
exchange ideas on that on the same level. So lessons learned, so to say, is um, as a city or from a city point of view, you really need to integrate your port authorities who are responsible of officially, sometimes inofficially for infrastructure planning in your port areas. Integrate them as soon as possible in your plans and vice versa. For example, here in Hamburg, they signed our cycling program. They signed it. So we want to take uh, them into the role to take responsibility also in those areas. Find legal tools, build a good network to influence um, all stakeholders. Pay attention on crucial bottlenecks and pay attention to intersections. Point highly out that active mobility contributes to an economic, economic successful port. Less individual motorized transport means less congestions for goods which are standing in the harbor and waiting to get out of it. So I know it's a bit a uh, liberal argument, but nevertheless, it's the truth. Um, develop at the same time soft and hard measurement solutions built on so-called low-hanging fruits and high-hanging fruits at the same time. Try to find a combination, uh, for example, develop a bus route or public transport, and at the same time, you develop with that um, active mobility. Last but not least, what I'm trying to say, develop a systematic view on the harbor and on port areas for transport and traffic. No doubt, it's absolutely a long muddy way. And sometimes you fish out strong fishes uh, from the river, but nevertheless, it is good for the whole area it is good if cities grow. It's good if uh, we interfere into the 10T discussion. Thank you so much. See you later for questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Heike, uh, for your inspiring presentation. And now uh, we have the final uh, presentation of this second session before the lunch. So now it's Teemu Surakka uh, from Aalto University, and he will tell us about online tools supporting decision-making on holistic smart mobility. Thank you, Tero. And I will try to keep it short. And um, we have several aims in Hub Mobile, and we the tools that we have been creating, we have been um, aiming for uh, creating capabilities for, for uh, planners. And for that, I think Kristaps and Inga already uh, covered that. So I will focus on knowledge sharing and the other aspect that we have been uh, aiming for with our tools is to not create something that displays something that is already working but adds some value so there will be uh, some uh, references to existing tools as well but my name is Teemu Soraka. I'm a researcher in, in Alta University, and I have been implementing the technical solutions in, in these online tools. These are not the only ones that are available. So there will there are uh, several others. In, in, in the HubMobile pages, 
but I will highlight three of them. And the first one is about assessing the potential impact. And with this, I would like to highlight that it, this isn't about uh, making a concrete uh, suggestion, although Sami highlighted that, that cities are different, that there are things to learn from. Uh, we like to give the stakeholders and the experts in the cities to really have the opportunity to assess the potential from their viewpoint. So we are not making any, any um, concrete benchmarking experiences or concrete suggestions. We are providing a tool for people to really um, really pinpoint the areas that maybe need to be addressed. And this is a, a published tool already. So self-assessment tool available on, on our web pages and the uh, link is below. And basically it is about what I have just addressed is to pinpoint certain areas that may be in the need of improvement or certain themes that may be in the improvement. I will come back to these themes later, but basically this is just an a tool to give you an impression as an expert or as a representative of a stakeholder to assess what is important for you. And of course, this scale may give you an, an impression of what is the status in, in Baltic Sea region, but we don't give the impression that, that you should do this or that. It's about your environment, your city, your stakeholders, and your opportunities to leap forward also. So basically, you have an opportunity to make a leap without taking any sort of incremental uh, improvements. And like I said, we are trying not to replace any tools that are existing. So for example, there are Green City tool that is ready to available. That is also quite simple for city planners to answer. That is aiming for sustainable urban planning. But we are aiming for with this self-assessment tool for wider, uh, wider broad of stakeholders. So for example, you could link this tool to, for companies to have an opinion. And for companies, the answers would be fairly straightforward or easy to answer. And we have uh, covered the original um, 
original uh, areas of sustainability. So, for example, environmental and uh, economical and societal uh, society, uh, society, uh, society, uh, sustainability. But, for example, like Sami mentioned, comfort. We labeled that as an attractiveness. So we have added that as a fourth dimension of, of this um, sustainability. So it's a combination of area to be attractive for companies, for people, for residents to come to interact, to be active, to have a good life. But that's about the first tool. Then about, about assessing the realized impact, we have combined or made a process for really cities to uh, document their best practices. And this is about basically to share the knowledge, share your insights, really boost your ego, if you like. So we have made a simple template. We have made a supporting documents explaining what we are meaning and we have described a simple process for participating the most in our mind the most important stakeholders and once again this is not about replacing the participatory tools of of hub mobile or any other on uh, any other tools this is our viewpoint of how you can easily uh, involve the stakeholders in this process. And this is an example of, of the tempa template. So this is all that the stakeholders will get. A simple description of the area, details, and I would like to point that, that the most important things in this template are the unique aspects and frame conditions that will explain how this solution was successful in the city that it was implemented. So basically, it's a really concise information piece about how to implement something in a city that hopefully is similar to your. And of course, there are similar approaches. For example, the framework of EAA and uh, we are not aiming to benchmark with this approach so we are aiming to share best practices so this is a real example of a uh, Turku Ferry Pikes uh, implementation that has been already done has some reasonable idea of a cost, has reasonable idea of the user base and such. And although this has been assessed by the research group, this could have been done by the real stakeholders as well with the details 
the unique aspects and the frame conditions that have been shared. Um, the final thing about our approach is about connecting these different tools. And quite logically, if you are sharing the results, you probably would like to share the results. And uh, we like bubble. We are not aiming for replacing bubble. They have really good inclusion of solution providers. They are really good in active promotion. They are really good in quite many things, but they lack the opportunity to filter the solutions based on your immediate needs. So basically what we have done it is that we have created the database that is hopefully filled, filled with your solutions in the future. That is filtered, that can be filtered with operation conditions, or that can be filtered with the immediate needs of your area concerning sustainable mobility. And there is a link to the initial site, or the site will be the same, but, but currently it's only, a, on, only a in, in the work in progress. And I will be happy to answer any questions after the launch. And uh, also, I will be really happy to discuss any future potential of these tools. <laughs>